The Guardian News. Locker room banter is not just about Trump it's men everywhere. Gary McNair has accosted a stranger. He's trying to find out what men say about women in private. The man admits it's not always complimentary. What kind of thing? Well, says the man, if a nice woman goes by, we'll say, she's, you know, etc. McNair's having none of it. Don't give me you know, etc., he says. What did you actually say? Deep breath. I, mate, I suppose I'd maybe say I'd smash her back doors in. It's language like this that McNair is feeding into locker room talk, a rapid theatrical response to Donald Trump's grab them by the pussy comments that were leaked last October. What McNair wanted to know was whether Trump's conversation with the presenter Billy Bush was the aberration of a billionaire TV star or an example of a more widespread male malaise. Was it locker room banter, as Trump claimed in his apology, and if it was, would his remarks have been any more acceptable? It was the one statement he almost apologized for, says McNair, author of A Gambler's Guide to Dying. Before the machine moved on, there was a moment when we almost had a discussion about what place in society that kind of language has. There were those who sided with the Daily Show host Trevor Noah, who said, there's a big difference between saying dirty words and glorifying non-consensual sexual contact. Then there were the Trump apologists who called it a private conversation that shouldn't have gone public. In turn, there were the star athletes who denied men ever talked like that locker room or not. That seemed to finish it, says McNair. I wanted to call bullshit, because guys do talk like that. I've heard it. Staged at Edinburgh's Traverse by the theater's artistic director, Orla O'Loughlin, Locker Room Talk is a work in progress in which four women wearing headphones relay verbatim testimonies drawn from hundreds of interviews. The all-female casting was McNair's way of presenting the discussion in a fresh light. It was the central idea, says the Erskine-born playwright. It felt like the last person we needed to hear on stage was a comfortable white guy, but I also felt the need to do something. With men on the stage, it would run the risk of becoming an apology or a celebration, with women, it antagonizes itself. To compile the material, he made stickers and business cards appealing for volunteers, stopped men on the street and found interviewees in gyms, building sites, schools and sports grounds. By the end, he had 12 hours of recordings. The men talked about privilege and patriarchy, about where to draw a line of acceptability, about rating women on a 1 to 10 scale and about what women might think of that, it's not even on the radar. In the playground, boys used much the same prejudicial language as their fathers, they found it so funny to make fun of girls. I love talking to people and I think everyone's point of view is worthwhile, says McNair, the son of a police officer and an office worker. As a writer, I can't reflect society if I shut myself away. I'm trying to prove that a separate language exists and why it's there and that's me moving out of my lefty bubble and trying to engage with people who are saying the things I wouldn't normally say. Gary McNair in Donald Robertson is not a stand-up. I'm trying to prove that a separate language exists. That's moving me out of my lefty bubble. Gary McNair Photograph, Tom Searle Why do men do it? When McNair asked that question himself, one man said he'd just taken the risk. Whether they took the risk to build trust, for camaraderie, seeking approval from other guys in the pack or whether they just wanted that big outrageous laugh, McNair speculates, trailing off. It's continually giving me pause as I remember something I said that embarrassed a friend when I thought it was going to be funny. Was that worth the risk? I'm doing exactly the same. He found that when men did restrict their use of such language, it was less to do with altruism than to prevent women choosing to take offense. They were effectively shifting the blame for hurtful behavior onto the victim. It absolves them of responsibility, McNair says. Sometimes we'd have a chat about whether women might not be offended but hurt, vulnerable, scared or threatened. These things guys don't really want to admit to themselves that their language and behavior would lead to someone feeling scared. His conclusion? The last thing I want to do is apologize for Trump, 
but people are unaware of how similar they can sound. I don't think there's a socio-economic divide that correlates with sexism. The things I've heard people say in the pub in the afternoon are the same as Trump, who's a rich guy they're just talking about it differently. They're closer than we like to think.